Hello, everybody. Hopefully you had a good break. Um, thank you for joining us tonight with our statewide star party, our first night. We are so excited that you're here with us. Um, and we, as promised, at 8.30 are going to be doing telescope observing. Uh, Sarah will be able uh, to explain to you why it's not quite live. Um, it is very cloudy and rainy in the Twin Cities tonight. So um, we are keeping all of our fingers to and toes crossed for clear skies later, later this week for sure. I'm just checking my notes real quick to make sure I'm not forgetting to tell you about um, imp important things that are that are happening. And so before our little break, I was mentioning that we have another exciting lineup tomorrow evening and every night this week through Saturday. So please check out our statewide star party website. We'll put the link again in the chat box. Each night has a different Zoom link. And so you'll want to make sure that you register to get that link. And now it's 8.30. It's time to start observing. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Sarah Comparud, our Planetarium Program Coordinator. I'll let her introduce the other members of our Bell Museum Planetarium team and um, take it away. Let's go, folks. Send in all your burning astronomical questions into the Q&A box. Sarah, it's all you. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, as you might know by looking out your window, Minnesota weather yet again did not cooperate with us tonight. But that does not mean we don't have things to share with you as seen through our telescopes. Now, I'm going to burst a few bubbles here that telescopes cannot see through the clouds, at least not ours. So if the clouds are there and you can't see through it with your eyes, neither can our telescopes. But um, I, along with Tad, who is also here, uh, Tad, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Tad, uh, Thaddeus, name there on um, other documents. Um, I'm the planetarium educator here at the Bell, um, and I'll be sort of chiming in, helping Sarah out with questions. And we're just going to talk about space stuff. As, as Sarah was saying, we've got some images here we can show you because uh, Minnesota is, well, Minnesota weather is Minnesota weather. So there we go. Um, if you are looking for warmer skies, uh, a nod to our last, uh, to, to Connie, uh, my background behind me there, my virtual background is uh, in Albuquerque. It's the Sandia Mountains uh, in New Mexico. Um, we've also got some people in our, our Q&A uh, there who've seen the skies out west and seen how absolutely beautiful it is. Uh, and I know there's probably three people, Simone, Jim, and Assis, I think you're watching, uh, who have those beautiful skies right now. So I'm very jealous of that. I just look at the forecast for Albuquerque and it's gonna be super clear all week. Uh, I'm just so jealous right now. So, but Tad and I, over the past few weeks, we have been able to get out and take advantage of when the nights are clear to bring you what you'll see tonight. Um, so tonight what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore some of the planets that are visible in our sky. So um, let's start with just how do we read our star map? So this has been in the chat and we can put it back there too and you can find it on our website. Um, here is our star map of our sky for November and December. And if you take a look at it, um, we have the outer circle is our horizon. So that's going to be where the sky appears to meet the ground, kind of where your tree line would be. Um, and towards the middle of the map, that's what we call our zenith, that points straight above us. Um, so the closer something is to the center of our map, the closer it is to looking up, like standing outside, just looking up versus closer to the edge of our map, like Jupiter and Saturn are here, as we see, they're kind of in the southwest corner of the map. They're going to be closer to the horizon. Now, if we're looking at this map, you might also notice our directions. The directions around the edges seem to be a little goofy because north and south, if you think those are in the right spots, it almost seems like east and west are flipped. Well, it turns out star maps are not meant to be read while staring at the ground because the stars are not on the ground, they're above us. So what you're supposed to do with this map, if you do have a printed copy or if you have a copy on a, a smart device, something out with you, you find out which direction you're facing. So if I'm standing here at the Bell Museum and I'm looking out to the tree line across the soccer fields, kind of out past the pond, um, that is south from where we are here at the museum. And so I'd hold the south of this map to my torso and then I'd actually hold it and flip it above my head. And by doing that, east and west are then proper, pro properly aligned when you're holding the map above your head. 
So that way it's an easier transition to saying, okay, this looks kind of like it's in the Southwest where we see Jupiter and Saturn, and it's a more direct comparison to what you'll see in the sky and where you should actually look. So we're gonna use this map a little bit tonight to show us where uh, three of these visible planets are that you do not need a telescope or binoculars to see. But there's also a few things out in the sky that are so far away that are not on our map because you do need a telescope in order to see. And that's where um, our telescopes on the roof deck come in handy. So let's take a look at the first thing that's probably the most obvious in our night sky when it's up. It's the moon. Now, just this past month in October, we had what's called a blue moon, where we had two full moons in one calendar month. And this is actually the image that Tad took from a roof deck on uh, October 30th. So it was just before the official full, um, full moon, but it is a glorious shot here. Now, what we also learned, and we kind of knew when we were going up to take this shot, is the full moon puts off a lot of light. And so it like drowned out a lot of the other deep space objects we were trying to image as well. And so if you do want to go out and look for things in the sky, like was mentioned with Globe at Night um, app and that project, going out when there is no moon is going to be the best for some of those fainter objects. Now, Tad, you took this picture. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you did when you were taking it? Sure. Um, for, so for those who are into astrophotography um, or, or thinking about it or curious about it, uh, this is in many ways a very simple image of the moon. Um, it's taken using a DSLR. Um, so your general digital camera that you find these days. Um, and it was a, a Canon T6. Um, and this was attached to the back of a telescope. So that that is how it's this magnified in, in this view. Um, it was actually attached to the back of my personal telescope. Uh, that was an eight inch or is an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain, a Celestron. Uh, and then I took a, a single exposure. So this is not a stack of images like um, you might, uh, which you might do with other with other objects. Um, but this is just one single image. Uh, if I remember correctly, the, this was a exposure of like a one two thousandth of a second. Um, so very, very short exposure, uh, which is actually what I really like about the moon. It is very easy. Uh, the, the moon and the sun are very easy to, to photograph uh, in, in certain ways. Uh, the moon is probably the easiest out of anything in the night sky. Uh, and it doesn't take a lot of time to take a photo. Uh, even when it's when it's not full, when it's a tiny crescent, there's still a lot of light, so you can find it very easily in the sky. Uh, and there's always sort of different things to see. Uh, this this image in particular, and I and I think the next one Sarah has as well. Uh, um, this is an unprocessed image, but it still shows uh, these magnificent craters all across the moon. Uh, and this is the second one actually. This actually shows a little bit better. Um, so the the previous image was unprocessed, so nothing didn't do anything to it because um, I don't have that great skills in Photoshop. Um, so I, I don't feel the need to waste my time trying to do anything and making it worse. Uh, what I did do though, uh, is very simple. I inverted the colors. Uh, and I did this because A, I think it looks really, really cool. Um, that was really the first reason I did it. I just think it looks cool. But then I realized that there is a lot more that you can see here. Uh, the, the crater at the bottom, Tycho Crater, um, which uh, Sarah, I think you've got your mouse there. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the youngest craters on the moon, like 100 million years old, um, when the colors are inverted, I think the rays actually stand out a lot more clearly, um, those dark lines streaking out from it. Uh, but this is an inverted view. So if we if we go back to the previous one, the, the true moon, um, the rays are still there. And maybe it, maybe now, it, to me, it, it was, it's easier to see now. Um, but there are these white streaks um, that don't stand out quite so much against those brighter areas that they're in. Um, these streaks are across the, the highlands of the moon. Um, and But if we go to the inverted image, because again, I do think it's easier to see, uh, we can sort of more clearly pick them out. I'm pointing to the screen and I don't know why. Um, we can more clearly see where those streaks are. Um, sorry, I've got the mouse moving. Um, and that shows us the, the site of the impact. But it also shows, if we look down at the bottom, um, these streaks that are coming out, but they're not directly... They're not leading directly back to Tycho Crater. Um, Tycho Crater actually seems like it might be a multiple impact crater. Um, the the one that we see here would actually be the last crate, the last impact that occurred, um, and other impactors came in probably right before it, um, and they hit in slightly different spots. So the ejecta was thrown out in different ways. 
Um, and we can see that just by the location of those of, of where the rays are and where they, they trace back to. Um, again, this all happened very recently. So um, this was uh, about 100 million years ago or so. Um, so this was roughly, I mean, the dinosaurs would have been able to see this um, if their necks bent upwards, but I don't know if they did. So who knows? Uh, the other big craters do stand out as well. Um, and Sarah, feel free to jump in. I'll just keep talking. Um, the, the very actually largest craters that we see on the moon, some of the oldest ones, are all these large round areas near the, the well, especially near the top. Um, maybe Sarah, we can you know, just sort of indicate where they are. Uh, these dark ones are called Maria. So these are the mo really the most distinctive areas on the moon. Um, the different craters there, the dark Maria, make up the features of the man in the moon or the rabbit in the moon. Um, I have a hard time imagining these things. I'm not, I've, I've never been good at finding these features in the moon, but hopefully some of you looking at it can see that. Um, can we can imagine see the rabbit, like if we look over here on the right hand of the image, these are kind of the rabbit's ears and the head, and he's kind of doing a somersault. So I almost imagine the rabbit's tail is this one down here. That's how I imagine the rabbit in the moon. Oh, okay. I always thought that the back, that was the head, but then over to the right, um, I always thought that was supposed to be the back legs. No, that's Mark, not, not, not Chrysian, but down. Um, it's so easy, I'm pointing with my cursor. I wish you could see the mouse cursor. Um, yeah, and I think I think once you see it, um, again, people looking at this, you, you've probably seen it. Um, or maybe you can imagine it more easily. I always thought that Mari Chrysian was actually like the bunny, like the tail, like the fluffy, the fluffy tail. Um, Mari Chrysium, I'm sorry. Um, that's the one for anyone watching who doesn't know. Um, way up in the the top, the top right air uh, part of the moon here, about two 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 o'clock. Um, that's Mari Chrysium. Um, and again, I should say all these areas we call them Mare or Maria. Um, they get that from the word the Latin word seas. Um, so the, some of the first astronomers, first people look at the moon. Um, they thought they were filled with they were dark areas, so they thought they were filled with water. Um, so they named them after, um, or they gave them the word seas. Um, they give them very melodramatic names as well. Um, I'll get my moon map up so I can I can bring some up. Um, uh, Mari Chrysium, like I said, is um, the is the sea of crises. Uh, and sir, maybe I can just share my screen because I don't just want I, you know, go for it. I'm gonna read all these. Um, there we go. Uh, so Mari, the sea of crises. Um, we have the Sea of Tranquility. Um, some of you might know that, along with um, the Sea of Serenity. Those, those two seas in the area right in between those two seas featured rather prominently back in 1969, because um, that's where the Apollo 11 mission landed. Um, we have the Sea of Nectar, the Sea of Vapors. Um, Mary Kojitum, sea that has become known. I, I don't actually know the, the sort of history behind that name. I, I, I really should look it up because I, I find that just sort of a fascinating sea that has become known. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I personally don't know where that where they came where they got up uh, where they came up with that. Um, and then we do see the smaller craters as well. Um, so we can tell actually the the age of craters by how dark they are, uh, or I'm um, sorry, excuse me, how how bright they are. Um, so the very bright spots we see like Tycho crater down there on the bottom, uh, the southern pole of the moon. Um, we saw Copernicus here, which we will see an image again in, in the image I took, Aristarchus, uh, Starkus, Kepler crater. Um, these are areas that we can tell they're young because they're bright. And this is actually where the surface of the moon, the, the rock, the regolith has been disrupted um, and it hasn't had time to, to darken in color. So other older craters, um, I'll probably say uh, Grimaldi down there, um, they've either when, uh, over enough time, over billion, or hundreds of millions, billions of years, um, those craters have been hit by tiny little micrometeorites. Um, so little impactors, um, little bits of dust, and that's caused the soil to just darken a little bit over time, uh, or excuse me, the, the regolith to darken a little bit over time. Uh, I, I shouldn't say soil because as far as we know, there's nothing living or has never been anything living on the moon. So there's no organic matter on the moon. Um, so it's not like soil that we think of like when we go outside the rock of the, what the moon is made of is truly rock and dust and um, very similar to what we find here on the earth. The earth and the moon formed from the same, the same uh, large body, um, but without all the other organic material. There is water on the moon though. Um, we do know that. So I'll give the screen back to you. 
Um, in fact, we know now just over the past two weeks, we know there's a, a lot more water on the moon. If you took about a square meter, uh, like square yard of, this, of the lunar regolith, you'd get about 12 ounces of water out of it on average across the entire moon. Um, this is information that was actually gathered uh, by the SOFIA telescope, um, which stands for Stratospheric Observer. Oh, hold on. I never get this right. Um, gonna, I'm going to look this one up just to make sure. The and that Sophia was relatively telescope. recently, too. So that was in the yeah. past two weeks that uh, the discovery of more water on the moon um, that came through. So the story of water on the moon has kind of flipped back and forth over a long period of time. Is there? Yes, of course there is. That's why we call them Mare without that there be huge oceans of water. Then no, there's not because the astro astronauts went there and they weren't like drowning or anything when they landed in the Sea of Tranquility. Um, so this idea of there being water on the moon has definitely been back and forth. And so that's where Apollo 11 landed kind of there in the Sea of Tranquility. Did you find it for Sophia there, Tad? I did. I put it in the chat because I, I um, I'll, well, hopefully I'll go in the chat here. I'll make sure I get that right. Uh, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, or SOFIA. And if you look up SOFIA, um, maybe, I'll, I, maybe I'll share this again, because this, this is one of the mo more audacious telescopes, audacious telescopes. Um, SOFIA is a telescope that is inside a plane. Uh, it's a two and a half meter, a uh, hundred inch or so telescope that is in the back of a 747. Uh, and there you go, just take that in for a second. It sounds crazy. Um, that being said, it's actually not the first telescope of its kind. Uh, there are actually two telescopes in planes before it. Um, and it actually, it works amazingly well. Um, nowadays, these computers, these are, are computer controlled. So as the plane flies, the telescope can still stay tracking on its target. Um, and it's flying above, or uh, not above, it's flying very high up in our atmosphere. Um, and it's flying above the clouds. It's flying above most of the water and uh, in our atmosphere. And that water and the atmosphere gases, those absorb different types of light. Um, so once we get above those clouds, we can actually observe more and a wider range of, of light, um, leaving just getting away from just optical and going into the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, and we can make these, these very, very cool discoveries. Um, so Sophia has has found this great evidence of water on the moon. It's studied everything from supernovas to red giants to uh, planets in our solar system. Um, wh whatever you know, whatever it makes sense for it to study, and whatever is is viable for it to study. Um, and you can imagine how valuable this is, um, especially here in Minnesota uh, on a night like tonight, and even tomorrow night, I think, uh, where if you can get above those clouds, it's just so much nicer. I will probably mention a few times how annoyed I am at the sky um, over the next 45 minutes or so, however long we're here, uh, because it is it is a little frustrating. Um, but I shouldn't be too mad because we did have amazing skies last week. They were incredible. I got a chance to go out observing. Um, and, uh, and, and that definitely made, it definitely makes all the clouds worth it when you do have those really beautiful skies, um, especially when you get away from the city. So with that, I do want to um, just mention a few things about Tycho Crater here in this uh, southern hemisphere of the moon. We can see it in this picture that Tad took the other night. Um, but Tycho Crater, it doesn't necessarily look like it'd be that big because it's quite small compared to the, the rest of the moon. But it is a really very large crater because we, we can see kind of smaller flashes of white here that are the tinier craters. But from edge to edge here, this crater in the southern hemisphere is about 53 miles across and has this really interesting central mountain, central peak in the middle of it. Because when the impactor came in and crashed into the moon, that sent all that eject out, all those lines that we see kind of streaking out from this crater here in the south, it raised up a central peak in the uh, middle of this crater. And that central peak is almost um, just about a mile and a quarter tall. And so it kind of crashed in, but then the rebound came up, creating this uh, this mountain in the center of the crater. Um, so that's actually a really fascinating just feature on the moon. And the other one that I briefly want to point out before we get to one of the planets we can see tonight, a Tad mentioned it earlier, it was Copernicus. So it's up, um, not quite the center of our lunar um, image here, 
but it is kind of in the middle of our Maria. So it's not quite as prominent as Tycho um, as far as the contrast goes, but it is just off to the left here, the center of our image. And so the craters we see on the moon actually help us date how old that surface is. And so Tycho, like Tad said, is pretty young. It's only about 110 million years old because the, the edges of these craters are still very sharp and distinct. As they age, as micrometeorites hit them, they kind of wear down, they weather and kind of erode down to be smoother edges. And so that's one of the re reasons we can, we can date these craters is by how sharp their edges are and how um, not weathered the crater walls are and the central peaks are. And the moon kind of captures this history of the past 4.5 billion years just here on the surface. And we're lucky enough, we get to see it up in the sky on a regular basis. So right now we're almost near the new moon phase. We'll just have to wait about another week for it to come back out to the crescent phase. But um, here is a go gorgeous picture, I think, Tad, that you took here just about a week or so ago. But I do want to show another image that we took because I find it really exciting, especially what's happening right now um, in space um, exploration. So we go back to our star map here. Um, down south, we have these five pentagons that we have indicating where the planets are in our night sky. And so this next one I put out is actually Mars. It's right now in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. We can see kind of this, it's called the circlet of Pisces. And then it kind of connects down in this V-shaped up to this kind of weird triangle up at the top. This is the constellation of Pisces, and it's right below the constellation of Pegasus, which we just learned about with the Globe at Night app. So Pegasus right here is not quite at the zenith, so it's not quite straight overhead, but it is nice and prominent in our southern sky, and so definitely look for that. And Mars is going to be just off to the southeast of Pegasus. But what does Mars look like? Well, in the sky, it's going to look like um, a red dot, and it's going to be nice and bright in the sky. But through our telescopes, what we were able to capture a few different details a few weeks apart here. So if we look over on the left-hand image here, this black and white image that was taken kind of at the beginning of October. Um, we don't always want to take pictures in color because sometimes color can be distracting, but yet sometimes color is awesome. And so we have cameras that can do both. And what we see here in this black and white image is kind of these darker areas streaking across kind of down at a diagonal across the face of Mars. Now, to the best of my ability, that kind of darker peak right here that we're seeing kind of streaking across uh, the face of Mars, and I'm, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation. So Tad, if, if you can do this any better, please let me know. Um, it's Sirtis Major Platinum, which is a darker region on Mars that may have been a shield volcano. But what's even more interesting than this, um, you know, I love volcanoes. I think they're really cool. And the fact that the ones on Mars are very similar to ones we have here on Earth. But if we look just off to the left of where it kind of comes down to this point here, just off to this left where it kind of has that lighter indent, that is where we're sending the Mars Perseverance rover. And so we were able actually just a few weeks ago to take a picture of the space of Mars where we're actively sending a rover right now. And so it launched here from Earth in July, and it will land on Mars here coming up in February. Um, one of the other cool things is that we look over in the colored image a few weeks later, because Mars' day is a little bit longer than Earth's day, it's just a little, little bit over 24 hours, we see a slightly different face of Mars each, uh, each day. And a few weeks later, we actually will see this little white part here when we looked at it in the colored image. And up at the top there, that's actually the Mars's south pole. And so that's the south polar ice cap because right now Mars's northern hemisphere, much like here in Minnesota, is in winter. And so in Minnesota, we're approaching our winter season. And so that means that Mars was just in opposition, so it was just opposite the Earth and the sun, and we are getting a nice shot of Mars's south pole and the polar ice cap there. So if there's any questions, I do, I do want to encourage you to use the Q&A box because Tad and I, my favorite part of the day is our questions. Um, and we want to know what you guys are interested in. We're just going to show you here what we can see in the sky if, if the clouds went away. These are things that you don't need any equipment for, but please feel free um, to start dropping questions in here. 
Um, so, well, sir, I'll actually I'll answer one that was uh, asked a little before because um, it allows me to show off another image. Um, and D asked uh, there. Well, they, they mentioned there's a large sunspot on the sun, um, and they asked, "Will we be seeing northern lights this week here in Minnesota?" Um, I'm going to start with the answer I gave D, which is maybe. <laughs> Uh, Northern Lights are pretty hard to predict more than about 24 hours out. Um, so maybe is always a good answer. Uh, it doesn't look like at least in the next day that we probably have a great chance of seeing the Aurora. Um, if you, uh, well, maybe I'll just, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share one of my favorite um, websites for this. Uh, the Aurora forecast. This is the Aurora forecast from um, uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and they do it uh, across the Northern hemisphere here. Um, and so looking at North America, um, just for today, um, the greatest extent you might see if you go all the way up in Northern Canada, um, dress warmly. Um, the lowest extent isn't even reaching, I think down to the border there. Uh, so tonight, the next few nights, again, maybe. Um, but we do, we um, at least as of a couple of days ago, I believe it's still there from what I've seen, um, we do have a very, very large sunspot grouping on the sun. Uh, and I'll try to get that up here. Um, this is the sun as of, uh, well, good thing I put it in the file name. Uh, this is the sun as from uh, November lit, uh, no, November 5th, excuse me, November 5th at uh, about 3.30 there. Um, so that sunspot grouping, those dark areas um, are looking, are cooler areas actually on the sun, but they do indicate areas of a fairly extreme magnetic field activity. Um, and because this, this is the sun, it kind of looks sort of featureless, I, I understand, um, to give you some sense of scale. Well, we'll come back to that one. Um, this is roughly it in, in scale. So uh, there's the earth, and there you go. About 110 earths could fit all the way across the sun. Um, in fact, just the one small grouping we're seeing, there's the one very nice distinct sunspot that's about earth sized. Um, so when we get fairly large groups like this, and as far as it goes for the sun, especially right now near solar minimum, uh, this is a very distinctive large grouping. Um, this does indicate an area where there's a lot of magnetic field activity. So there's large magnetic loops coming out of the sun. And there's a chance that these magnetic loops, they can break and then they can reconnect and they, they spark um, kind of like a short circuit. Um, if, you, if you've ever uh, been, been really dumb with electrical work, uh, that short circuit is what we call a flare. <laughs> I realize some people might get mad about me saying that some people are dumb for electrical work, but I feel like if you're not taking proper safety precautions, you're doing something wrong. Electrical work is very, very dangerous. So please make sure you ground yourself, make sure you have proper permit works. And if you're permitted work, if you're ever not sure what you're doing, hire a licensed electrician, please. Please don't do anything dumb with electricity. It's, it's very dangerous. Um, but when it comes to the sun, it can be even more dangerous because these flares that happen, these short circuits on the sun, these flares release millions of volts of energy and they can they streak out through space. They leave the sun, this energy leaves the sun. It streaks out through space um, and it can interact with us here on the earth. And in particular, it interacts with our magnetic field. Um, when the magnetic field of the earth, um, when all this energy reaches the magnetic field of the earth, it gets channeled downwards um, to the north and south pole where the magnetic fields um, propagate outwards from the earth. Um, and this energy comes down and hits it hits our atmosphere, it hits the air in our atmosphere, it hits elements like oxygen and, and nitrogen. And these elements, in particular oxygen, um, when you heat them up, they glow different colors. Um, so if we get a flare, we can get um, charged particles leaving the sun, hitting the Earth's atmosphere, heating up the air, um, causing them to glow, causing the aurora. And this sunspot grouping right here did at least a couple of days ago have the chance um, for an M-class flare, which is on the higher energy scale of flares. Um, now, I'm, I haven't read up on whether or not that happened. I, I, I'm not sure I feel like I would have heard more news if it had. Um, but if that happens with this sunspot grouping, which again is still there, um, then we do have the chance for some aurora. And hopefully just beautiful Aurora, um, hopefully nothing else. There have been some rather 
bad times when it comes to uh, geomagnetic activity on the sun, uh, in particular in 1989. Some of you actually watching probably remember this. In 1989, there was a massive uh, X-class flare from the sun, which hit the earth and took down Quebec and the Northeast power grid. Uh, because all that energy overloaded the transformers and burned them out. Uh, it was in recent history, probably I think the largest recorded uh, event in, in sort of the last few decades um, and cost millions of dollars worth of damage and took years to, to rebuild from. Oh, wait, I mentioned so this because I realize, it, I realize it is 2020. So I do just want to get you all prepped for whatever's left. There are, there are a few questions related to the sun there that you had up. Um, was that yeah. picture of the sun and the sun spots inverted left, right by any chance? Oh, hey, yes. Is that, uh, I believe that's Ron there. Yes, um, Ron asked this. Oh, by the way, if you heard about the blue moon, it was not actually blue, but you can do fun things in Photoshop. Uh, here we go. Yes. Um, this is uh, left, right. Um, so this was taken through, um, just like the image of Mars, actually. Well, one of the, the color image of Mars, uh, this was take, oh, wait, no, hold on. Um, no, I apologize. Uh, this was taken with a refracting telescope. This was taken with our, um, our 102 millimeter refractor, um, with a, uh, with a, a Herschel wedge, um, for you solar observers. This was taken with a Herschel wedge, which is a type of white light or full spectrum or continuum uh, type of solar observation uh, techniques, uh, things. Um, and it was, I used our, um, I used our ZWO ASI 183 millimeter camera for this. A lot of letters right there, but ASI 183 mm uh, camera was used to take this particular image. Um, this one, I think I might have stacked if I think I took a video actually. Um, so I took about five minutes of video and then some software stacked those frames. I felt like 20% of the best frames. Um, again, I didn't really do a lot of processing beyond that. Um, I don't want to muck it up too much. Um, so this is just a stack of frames and one frame probably would have been just fine as well. And in, in my not professional astrophotography way, one frame would have been fine too. But so yeah, we had another is telescope fun. question come in. Yes. Um, what telescope did you use to capture the images of Mars? Yeah. Uh, do you want to go back to that? I can, yes. Right. Okay. Um, the color image um, was taken with uh, an 8-inch, my 8-inch uh, Celestron. Um, I have a CPC 800. Um, it's my pride and joy. Um, I actually tried to do, and then it was, uh, and then it, it's color because I, we have a Canon that, uh, Canon DSLR, uh, the Canon T6. Um, so this um, was about 1 40th of a second and I believe about a 200 frames or so. I did actually try to do a little bit more sharpening on this and, and I can tell that because to me it doesn't look great. Um, although I hope, I hope you are impressed with it and I hope when I get more practice, it'll be even better. But Sarah, I think you took the image, the black and white image, didn't you? But I don't even remember anymore. We were up there so many nights <laughs> uh, the past few weeks. I don't remember which ones you took and which ones I took. Um, yeah, we've been trying to get every chance. Every time it's been clear, we've been trying to get out. And and for good reason. I mean, because Minnesota. Um, Minnesota weather. Uh, if it, It's black and white. So I'm going to guess it was taken with the um, with that ASI 183. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what telescope, though, might have taken it. I couldn't... Um, We'll have to go back in our notes and our file. Uh, we write these things down, don't we? Yes, we do somewhere, just not off the top of our head. We can't remember them. Um, but another black and white image I guys want to show you is kind of a fun one because I was able, um, if we take a look back at our star map here, um, we're going to move from Mars and we're going to move over to the southwest part of our sky to look at Jupiter and Saturn. Now, you may have seen these in our sky for, throughout the past few months because they've been prominent pretty, um, pretty, well, they've been pretty prominent in our sky since, uh, since the summer. Um, but they are setting closer and closer um, to sunset each night. But Saturn actually has been giving us a really cool view. And this was kind of one that I thought was a lot of fun because, well, here is one from our, our um, more recent um, imaging sessions. 
But then I went out and took a look at one of them that I took way back in college. So um, I don't know if you can tell the difference between these two because I, I did definitely zoom in pretty far on these. But take a look at the rings. So the image over on the right, which was taken at the beginning of October, we see that Saturn's rings kind of come down and it looks like the ones that are kind of on the bottom of the image are the ones that are in front of the planet. But if we look at the the image on the left hand of the screen, and I, I realize they are not the same resolution, but it almost looks like the rings that are on the top of the image are the ones that are in front of the planet because you can kind of see a faint color continuous here um, on the bottom part of the planet. Now, you might ask yourself, well, maybe it's just a camera that was upside down, and that's why the rings look like they're at a different angle to us. Well, it turns out that's not the case. It's as Earth orbits the sun, um, we do it once every year. Well, Saturn also orbits the sun, but its year is roughly 29 Earth years. And during this process of Earth and Saturn kind of each independently moving around the sun at their own speeds, what we see from Earth is different angles of Saturn's rings here. And so I um, kind of comparing these images taken quite a bit apart here, we can see that we've captured Saturn's rings at two different parts of its orbit around the sun. And so the GIF here kind of shows you as the Earth, um, our Earth perspective, sometimes it doesn't even look like this Saturn has rings because we're staring at the edge of them. And so it's kind of a fun thing to see, okay, where are the rings going to be now? And Ted, I know this is your favorite planet. Do you have um, a favorite feature of its rings? Yes. Um, it doesn't show in either of our images. Um, because uh, it, it, you can see it in the, in the nice animation there. Um, if you can pick out that, uh, again, I'm moving my mouse. So the, the gap in the rings, um, this gap in the outer part of the rings is called the Cassini division or the Cassini gap. Um, it's about a thousand miles wide. And it, it represents a true, not totally a gap. There's not nothing in that area. There's just not a lot of anything. Um, where the rest of the rings are fairly dense ice, um, that gap, the material in it is relatively sparse. Um, so there's not really enough of it there to reflect back a lot of light to us. Um, but it exists because there are moons around Saturn. There are 82 known moons. Um, and there's one called Mimas. Um, and Mimas is one of the shepherd moons of Saturn and its gravitational tug has caused an area where right around Saturn in the Cassini division, in fact, in that location, uh, it's like a tug of war. Um, so material that's there either gets pulled into Saturn or it ends up getting pulled outwards just by the little bit of a tug uh, by Mimas's gravity. Um, and spotting it is, it doesn't show up in the photograph, but even small telescopes four, six inches across can actually can pick out that gap there. Um, and so I think it's one of the easier, harder things for amateurs to see uh, when looking at Saturn. Um, it's really a good test um, for once you get used to looking through a telescope, once you get used to looking at the sky. Um, it's a good test to just sort of pick out something a little bit more difficult um, and then gives you a chance to work your way to even more difficult things or fainter things. So that's my favorite, one of my favorite parts of Saturn. There's also a moon called Enceladus, which is the best moon in the solar system. Um, there's a giant hexagon on the North Pole. Uh, it's, it's an amazing planet. Um, I'm going to try not to talk about it. I realize for every time Saturn comes up, I, I end up talking about it a lot, so I'm not going to. I'm going to mute myself. Well, what I like about it, if we go, uh, go to this slide here, is we can take our image from our observation deck here at the Bell Museum on the right-hand side of this slide and actually compare that to some of Galileo's early drawings from some of the very one of the very first telescopes to be used to look at the sky. And he also saw this detail of the rings around Saturn, but he didn't know what he was looking at. So you can see three different sketches he made, um, not knowing that these were rings around a planet. And he, again, he didn't be, he wasn't able to capture the Cassini division, um, nor are we with our telescopes here. Um, but he was able to capture those lobes kind of stretching off on either side of Saturn. And Tad, correct me if I'm wrong, but from edge to edge of the rings here on Saturn, about 29 Earths could fit across. So these rings do actually span fairly far out. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that um, I and we could probably work backwards because I always remember because it's about one light second across. Um, 
so that's uh about the distance from earth to the moon yeah yeah um and i'm i'm forgetting the speed of light which is embarrassing right now 186 thank you thousand miles per second so about 186,000 miles across um diameter of the earth is what about 8,000 miles that's a number i never remember Oh, well, see, you get the light, I get the earth. So I think if we put those together, um, we can leave it for our audience to figure out the math there. Oh. Saturn isn't the only <laughs> planet with rings. Actually, all four of our gas planets have rings. And we got a question not too long ago about what is the furthest object we can see with our telescopes. Um, well, it turns out we can see pretty far. Because our planets that we've seen in our sky, we have Mars and Jupiter and Saturn. They're nice and bright. And people from all around the globe have known about those for centuries. So they were never really discovered because you can just see them in the sky. No telescope required. But um, our next planet. Actually, so Uranus, before we go to the next planet. What? Before we go to the next one. There's, go for it. Uh, you have the last thing on there, Saturn? Yeah, there's two questions which which relate. They're just like perfect. Um okay. Uh, Danowin, I'm, I'm not sure if that's the, the full name there. Uh, Danowin uh, asked, how do the rings stay around Saturn and not break off? Um, and then we had an anonymous question, what causes the rings of Saturn? What are we actually seeing? Um, and these work really well together um, because one leads into the other. Uh, the rings of Saturn um, were formed most likely. The best evidence right now we have says that they were, they were formed a few hundred million years ago when a large moon or maybe two moons got very close to Saturn and they got torn apart. Uh, they were pulled within Saturn's Roche limit, R-O-C-H-E, the Roche limit. Um, so the tug of Saturn's gravity just tore these moons apart. Um, and we're left with ice, 99% ice. Um, we know this, uh, the composition from spacecraft like the Cassini spacecraft, which spent uh, what, almost 15 years around Saturn. Um, we know it from using telescopes, um, Telescopes like, if not exactly like Sophia, um, which can look at uh, the light bouncing off the rings back to us. Um, and so we're seeing just reflected light from ice, from snow. Um, very similar to like when you step outside in Minnesota winter and it's blinding bright because you have that fresh fallen snow, that's Saturn. Um, and they're made up of trillions of tiny pieces of ice. So it looks like one big solid object when we see it, but they're actually incredibly small. In fact, if you're, you're, you're watching this, if you're you're watching this on a phone, your, your thumb is there, you're about to swipe away, don't. Just look at your thumb briefly. Um, because those particles in Saturn's rings are about the same size as your thumb, um, just a few inches across on average. That's the, the average size. Some get a little bigger, some are smaller. Um, and they are in fact disappearing. So the, the particles there uh, will are being pulled into Saturn um, through Saturn's gravity, um, through um, becoming charge and, and moving along the magnetic field lines, um, the ice gets electrically charged, um, they, are, they are decaying. Um, so at a rate of thousands of tons per day, they're disappearing. Um, so in a sense, nothing is keeping them there. They, they will disappear. Um, so if you haven't seen them, I do hope you get a chance. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is, is you do wanna hurry and go see the rings of Saturn because they're gonna be gone in like 300 million years. So We're yeah, pausing for the laughter there because we know you're all laughing. That was hilarious. Some planetarium astronomy jokes here. Yes, um, but not all planet or all, all four of our planets have rings actually. So Saturn's not the only one. And our next planet that we can see in our sky with our telescopes is actually the very first planet ever discovered, and it has rings. Now I'm going to say it's the first planet ever discovered because it is so far away that you cannot see it with the naked eye. And we did need to use a telescope to find it. Now here with our telescopes on the roof deck, um, we, can't take, we can't take out its rings as prominently as we could Saturn's. But this is Uranus. And we are able to get this nice blue color here. And so while we can't pick out rings, this is one of the furthest things, but not quite the furthest thing that we can pick out with our scopes of things that are in our solar system. Now, Ted, did you have a question? It looked like you had a, a thought there. Uh, I did. Um, this is where we see the limitations of technology. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a diagram up to explain this one. Don't worry. It's not a complicated diagram. Um, when we look at this image here of, of Uranus, um, you might see it's sort of, it's sort of elongated there. 
Um, it's like there's a there's it's it's shifted. Um, it's blurred. Um, and this happened because or this is there, um, not really in any sense because of of my astrography skills or lack thereof. It's not because of the camera. It's actually because of the telescope. Again, this was taken with my telescope, uh, uh, a Schmidt Cassegrain, and a Schmidt Cassegrain. Um, I'll trust y'all to look up a picture of it later. Um, it uses uh, a lens on the front and a mirror on the back, and then another lens. Um, the light bounces around and it comes out the eyepiece or it comes to the camera. Um, and if that isn't well collimated, if all the lenses and mirrors aren't in line, in particular, two mirrors aren't lined up, um, the light gets smeared. Um, so the face I was sort of making there was just because I look at this and I think, oh, I need to collimate my, I need to collimate my telescope. Um, luckily, Schmidt Cassegrains usually don't require a lot of collimation or not very frequently. Um, my telescope has gone back and forth across the country about half a dozen times. Um, so it's been jostled a bit um, and that's why it needs a little bit more work. Um, so as soon as we get clear skies again, that'll be my next project. Um, so that, uh, cause once the, once the mirrors are lined up, all that light comes to a point, it's perfectly focused um, and you get these very crisp images. Um, and uh, soon, once it stops snowing. Hopefully so. Well, I kind of still like this though because it does still give us that blue color that we that it it has. Because Saturn is your favorite planet, and it kind of has that yellowish color to what we just saw. But Uranus here is actually my favorite planet because it's so different. Because it was that first one ever discovered. Because its rings don't go side to side like Saturn's do. The rings of this planet actually go vertically uh, because its whole planet is knocked over sideways. It's almost North Pole instead of pointing up the top of the planet. It's pointed out at the side, almost directly at the sun for part of its orbit. And this blue color, I really like the shade of it, but this blue color actually comes from some of the gases in the atmosphere of this planet. It's methane. Now we have methane here on earth as well. It's one of the gases that come out in car cow farts. Um, but the methane here on this distant planet will absorb all the colors of light except for blue. And so the blue light is left to reflect back to us here at Earth in our eyes. And so that's how we can uh, tell this planet's made out of. This nice, subtle, soft blue actually gives, gives us information about what composition this planet is. But it's not the only um, planet that kind of has this nice blue color because this next planet that's a little bit further away um, is actually the furthest thing in our solar system that Tad and I have tried to image. Now, I'll put a little caveat on that because I don't know if we've actually gotten a comet. I know the other night we were thinking about trying to find a comet, but it's so far away and they don't produce their own light. I don't think we actually attempted to, but we discussed it. Well, I did attempt to get one. Um, there is a picture floating up. Maybe we'll show that as a as a limits of many limitations of, of what I can do right now um, and what we can do with light pollution as well. Um, I did try to get a comet, although that being said, that comet was only, um, I think it was like 100 million miles away. So it was actually pretty close. Okay. So Neptune here is yeah. still the first thing that we've tried to, tried to image. And again, you can see this nice blue color to it. So this is a slightly different shade blue. It looks a little bit darker, um, but that blue again tells us there's methane in the atmosphere here. And so this is that farthest away um, object. But it's also Neptune and Uranus. We don't know much about them, not only us as uh, astronomers here, but NASA's only sent one spacecraft to these planets. And that's the only spacecraft that's been that far out in space to look at them. So collectively, as a scientific field, we don't know much about these last two planets in our solar system. And so it's kind of a big mystery. And it's kind of a fun one to think about that anything could be possible out here. And they're even kind of a subcategory of our gas giants because they do have faint rings like Jupiter and Saturn do, um, but they're colder out here. So we actually kind of give them a subclass of ice giants too. Again, there's such there's so many things about these plants we don't know yet because we've only been by them once. That was the Voyagers back in like the 80s and early 90s, I think, by the time they made it out here at Neptune. But it's worth mentioning, Voyager 2 uh, is still working. Um, in fact, just a couple of days ago, NASA reestablished contact with Voyager 2. Uh, it's now uh, almost 12 billion miles away from us. Um, Neptune is about two and a half billion miles, some context. Uh, Saturn's a billion miles. Um, so Voyager 2 is still working for, for 
decades now, it's it's still going. Um, it is an incredible, incredible piece of technology. Um, running off uh, eight track tapes um, and uh, le- less wattage than a than a sixty uh, less than sixty watts of energy. It, it, it's 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 very cool. Um, so if you look up Voyager two in the recent news, you'll see how they you know what it took to what it took to get in, t- in contact with it. It's, it's yeah, it's very exciting. Nineteen yeah. seventies technology when those things left Earth. Now we are near our end of our time, and there's still one more thing that we want to kind of tease you with because we can't image it yet because the date hasn't arrived. And so if we jump back to our star map. It looks like Jupiter and Saturn are fairly close together in our southwestern sky. And in fact, over the next few months, it's going to feel like they're going to get closer and closer and closer together until what we call a great conjunction happening here in December. And what's going to happen is they're going to get so close here that they're going to almost appear as if they're one double planet. So this is a shot through um, a software called Stellarium. It's a free open source software you can download for yourself. Um, Tad and I both really use it when we're looking up astronomical events and what, when to look for what and what's going to be visible. Um, but if you look here, on December 21st, at around just, uh, just before sunset, this looks like 1,800 hours, which is about 6 o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Jupiter and Saturn here, over on kind of the right side of this image, they almost appear to be overlapping. Their, their labels are overlapping. Because it is predicted that they're going to be so close together in our night sky as they're both independently orbiting the sun. Um, It's going to look like they almost line up. And so this here is what's being predicted to be seen through the eyepiece of a telescope. Where we have Jupiter on one edge of our eyepiece, in this case over on the kind of lower right. And then Saturn up in kind of the upper left corner. So this is something I'm really looking forward to. And I hope that you guys will kind of track Saturn and Jupiter over the next few weeks and months as we head into December. Um, because this conjunction doesn't happen very frequently here. And so that's something I want to leave you guys with um, as something to look forward to here as 2020 does come to a close. But we have just a few minutes left here. And Tad, you're really good at this. So I'm going to leave it up to you. Um, kind of rapid fire questions of things we've been asked. Because I know we've had a lot of questions come in both live here through the Q&A box, but then we have um, a lot of questions that came in through our past star parties that we're just not able to answer all of them because you guys have so many questions, which are awesome. We just can't get to them all. So are you ready for rapid fire? Yeah. Um, and well, I, I'm, I can sum up these really bad at this because I'm not always good to short answers as everyone who knows me knows. Um, I'll, I'll mention, I'll give a shout out actually first. It's not a question. It's, it's they notice a statement from an anonymous person, uh, in our QA. Um, they, they said that they got the most amazing views, um, in their 127 millimeter mead, uh, their telescope, um, of, of the comet Neowise and of Saturn, Mars, and Jupiter over just a few months during this, uh, I believe this past summer. Um, well with Neowise, it would have been this past summer. Um, but then they say my best view is with binoculars and then my scope of Jupiter with four of its moons coming out in a three-dimensional 45-degree angle. My heart almost stopped and I wish I had my camera but was still waiting for it to arrive. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I, I know that exact feeling. Um, when you get those perfect nights, when everything is just, you know, the stars align, um, you, it, yeah, it, it's just incredible. Um, and in and, and that, you know, in that, what they're saying there, um, you know, I've been mentioning my telescope a lot, um, but we actually, uh, I actually, I use binoculars quite a bit as well. Um, they're really great for narrowing down the field of view. In fact, this comet that we mentioned a moment ago, um, I was first looking for it with binoculars to get an idea of where to look. Um, and then I, and then I trained a telescope on it. Um, and I'll also say, um, even if you don't have a camera, um, one way that I really got started into solar observing, um, or one way that I got, I got more into solar observing was just by sketching, by drawing. Um, the sun requires a little bit more work to be safe, to be viewing it safely. Um, but with anything you're looking at, um, binoculars, telescope, it's just just naked eye, just going out and, and sketching the stars. Um, that's a really, really fantastic way to really cement what you're seeing and to, to really gain a new appreciation too of what you're seeing. Um, you start to, to look past the obvious things and pick out the fainter objects. Um, and I believe, I think Sarah, you're doing a sketching, you're talking about sketching later this week, right? We will be talking about sketching and how that can help our observation skills and we can see things deeper in the sky. So yeah, that's coming up on Saturday. 
Okay, cool. So I'll let Sarah talk more about that. Um, Kathleen says, I actually use the programming language that Voyager uses, shows your age. Um, I, it might not, what it, I'm not sure what Voyager used. If you want to throw in another note about that, um, most programming languages are still being used, believe it or not. Uh, so, you know, the world still runs a bit on COBOL, unfortunately, for better or worse. Um, okay, okay, so three here, quick questions. We have a minute. Um, would star charts change drastically if viewing the night sky from different planets in our solar system? Well, the stars themselves would still be basically the same, but where other planets are would be very different. Um, Connie asked, um, basic question, please explain planets versus stars versus moons. Unfortunately, that is not a basic question. Um, planets are, well, let's start with stars. Stars are objects that are massive enough that at their cores, they're fusing and releasing energy. That's not a great definition, but it'll work right now. Planets so stars are make their own light. Stars make their own light. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, planets are objects that are round, that are going around a star, actually going around our sun specifically, uh, and have cleared out the area around them. They've collected all the debris and stuff around them, or they're, uh, they're, um, they're the uh, gravitational center of their little world. And moons, <laughs> fun story, there is no official definition for a moon, but I'm going to say tonight, and Sarah, feel free to come in with something different. I'm going to say moons are natural satellites orbiting around planets. Um, I'd almost open that up to over around another object because Pluto has five moons, and that's a dwarf planet. Yeah, and we found yeah. other rocks orbiting around asteroids. So we have yeah. found asteroids that have its own moon. So moons yeah. are smaller particles that are natural satellites of another body. Yeah. That's not a star. Well, what, what, what constitutes smaller, though? What, what do you mean by smaller? Well, less massive. So that way the center okay, of the gravity, the, the kind of the Barry center, if you will, will be inside or near that larger body. So, okay. So, um, so the Barry center, the center of gravity will be inside that body. So the Jupiter sun system, the gravitational center of Jupiter and the sun, the Barry center of Jupiter and sun is actually outside of the sun. So what if we have, what if we have a rock that's sort of on its own, but isn't round? Oh no, I guess it was, it was massive enough to be, all right, let's move on. Um, okay, so our rapid fire here is quickly degrading into long answers. I know, because uh, but we a, might have time for one question. more before we have to conclude here this evening. Um, let's see, we, we answered. Um, Sarah, how about this one? Um, what caused Uranus to tip on its side? I know you were recently, you were, you were at a talk um, by Dr. Shannon. Uh, well, from the uh, University of Michigan, Lansing. Yes. yes. Dr. Shannon, uh, Dr. Shannon, um, d why is Uranus uh, tipped on its side? So we've long believed that Uranus is tipped almost uh, completely sideways because of one very large impact. Well, the talk I, I went to uh, about two, three weeks ago, uh, Dr. Schmall, what she was saying was that it probably wasn't just one impact. It was probably something to do with its accretion disk and how it was slowing and that its moons and its ring system as it was forming actually drug it and it kind of tilted it down and that only get it most of the way to its almost 90 degree uh, tilt, but then an impact or a series of smaller impacts could have helped tip it the rest of the way. So the fact that nobody was around four and a half billion years ago to know exactly what happened to Uranus and why it's the only planet on its side, um, an impact is likely to have played a part, but maybe not as big of a part as we originally thought. And so it's still a big mystery. Again, we've only been there once. So a great place to study more. I, I really do hope that we get a spacecraft out back to Neptune and Uranus within my lifetime. Absolutely. NASA, if you're listening, that's our vote for the decadal survey, Uranus and Neptune. I know the other places are cool, but Uranus and Neptune. Okay, but that does bring us to the end of our time together. Um, I do want to encourage you all to join us again tomorrow evening. We have brand new speakers, a little bit more on celebrating our dark skies. Um, we have a panel talking about a dark skies and the Voyager Park and becoming a dark sky site. And then ho hoping that tomorrow somewhat clears up. Um, we have Mark Job and his team, um, our friends really, from the Minnesota Astronomical Society. He'll be doing some telescope observations. Uh, they even have a remote telescope. So if it's not clear here in Minnesota, they might still be able to show us some live telescopes ring tomorrow through their remote telescopes. Um, and one last time, we want to thank all of our partners and uh, participants here this evening. This was our 
kickoff night and we have five more nights full of um, celebrating our dark skies here this week with lots of fun speakers and activities. We hope that you come back. Uh, please do make sure that if you do want to join us for another evening, each night has its own registration link. It's all free, but make sure to sign up for each night separately so you can come back and hopefully see some live telescope viewing. Fingers so crossed. thank you all um, so much for joining us this evening. We greatly appreciate it. We hope to see you again soon. Have a great night, everyone. Stay safe.